Hello, can everybody hear me? Are we good? Do we have audio? Before we go any farther, let me know. Let's see. Can you hear me? Can you see me? You guys are way too quiet. All right, we're all good. You can hear me, you can see me. So hey, welcome once again. It is Thursday, Thursday. It's a virtual tasting because we're stuck in place, but we need some Coro and some reserves Chardonnay to make this day a hell of a lot better. So let's get going and let's roll it out. As always with me, Kevin Brutico, Master of the Techniques and the Videos. Hey, Kevin. Hey, guys. And we have David Brutico with us again, as always. Hello. And we have tonight, we have a special guest. We have a vineyard worker with us tonight. We have Len Brutico. Say hi, Len. Hi, Len. Hey, there we go. Everybody's a comedian. That's my job. Knock it off. All right. So here we go tonight. So tonight's a very special night. Um, I got my coral shirt. You can see right here. I'm pointing over here. I've been drinking. There's nothing there. It's on this side. Yes, mirrored images on the radio. Yep, yep right there. Yep, yep, there it is right there. Okay. So um, anyway, we've been having a lot of fun doing these uh, videos and these tastings. And you can see I've never been on camera before in my life, if you've been watching the pre-show. Um, I'm very shy and I have a hard time expressing myself. So tonight, um, I love Coro. Coro is, uh, like I said, it's very near and dear to my heart because of the Zinfandel. Uh, because it is a wine that really makes me work harder to be a better winemaker, working with other winemakers in the area. We'll talk a lot more about the Coro, the Coro program, what it really means, a little more in depth. If you guys saw all the videos that we shot for Coro, all the winery, the grapes, uh, the crushing, that's Brutico. That was all Brutico. In fact, they were shooting the Zinfandel grapes from the blocks where we actually picked Coro from and our Zinfandel from. That's actually our crew. Uh, crushing those grapes. You can see we pick in small containers by hand. Those are called macro bins. Process them through. Um, so make sure if you didn't get to see all that, stay tuned for afterwards. Uh, we'll re-roll all those videos one more time for you because you don't get to see me enough as it is. I know you want a little bit more. And you can see uh, some of the actual crushing of the Zinfandel grapes. All right. Um, so um, a couple of really uh, matters to clean up before we get any further. We are continuing this program. So the Thursday, Thursday uh, virtual tastings will continue. We have a program set up. Um, so the last of the sales going on right now. Next week, we're going to do the Blissful Reds. So we're going to show a couple Blissful Rinds. That is actually a new release. Um, and the Bliss Chardonnay. And then we're going to be working on Barbera, Syrah, Sangiovese, and Candle Abra. Um, those wines, we haven't scheduled which day they're actually going to be. Once we do... Uh, we'll put that out. We're probably going to figure that out next week uh, and we'll announce that so you guys will know what weeks we're doing those wines. We're probably going to do those wines one at a time because they're such uh, different wines that you don't usually see and they're taste room only. So we're going to change the format around a little bit more uh, as far as that goes. We're going to make Lynn go out, shoot more video, stuff like that. So, you know, we'll have some fun. We'll actually make, we might let Steve back on again. We'll see. His screen test the last time was, eh, but anyway, we'll keep going. So tonight, it's all about, oh, Chardonnay. Hey, look at this. So Reserve Chardonnay. So this is a Brutico Reserve Chardonnay. Uh, it's a 2017. I think we just released this about two months ago, if I remember correctly. So it's just freshly out. Um, on our reserve program, uh, what happens is that we leave it in the barrel for an extra amount of time. We talked about this before when, the, when we talked about Chardonnay. So when we pull everything out, like right now, we are pulling out all the 2019 Chardonnay and getting it ready to be bottled, the Brutico Chardonnay. And then we put together the Brutico 19 Reserve Chardonnay, and now it's going to go back to barrel, and we will bottle it probably next January or February. So, um, so that's kind of that extra aging. It's about another nine months. So it actually is about 18 months like the Brutico Reds, what usually ends up for these Chardonnays. Uh, by doing that, we actually put it back in a barrel. It's called the piano barrel. Um, it is a um, proprietary barrel built by Rousseau for bur white burgundies. We don't, we can't tell you what's in the barrel because they won't tell us exactly what's in the barrel. But it's made for Chardonnay, and it does a great job. So by putting this wine back in only those barrels, whether they're older neutral ones or just one year old. It, uh, the wine gains some more flavors and um, more characteristics, and uh, it makes this reserve. So, enough talking as always. Let's start drinking, right? So, here we go. So, in this wine, there's some nice 
you get some really nice caramels. Oh my God, that creme brulee caramel coming through. And then there's like this, um, a citrusy lemon in there. And it is, it's really lemony. I don't know if it's lemon zest, lemon curd, maybe, uh, kind of similar to that, but I just I love that. So you got this real citrus note and a, and a touch of, um, God, it almost reminds me of, um, when you do that too and you get that and you get that that lemon curd maybe just a touch of some coconut behind that and that's kind of that same that caramelization from the barrels that oak kind of coming through mm. and then when I taste this wine up front I get there's a little pear kind of a melony like cantaloupe, real ripe like cantaloupe in the very front. And it kind of rolls back through. You get some nice little bright acid and you get some, and right in that mid palate just kind of pops up and you get a spiciness. Now, when you smell this, there's a lot of oak notes. There's a lot of that caramel and that uh, creme brulee, you know, and that butterscotch, that's all oak notes. But when you taste it, it stays very bright in the mouth and then you get a spiciness following that fruit on the very back end of that palate where the barrel kind of shows back up again but it's not overpowering um i chilled this wine down for about an hour and then i opened it up it's been sitting here on this table open for about 45 minutes so it kind of came back up to room temperature because when i first tasted it when it was cold it was really tight there wasn't a lot going on. In fact, it had kind of a, almost a bitterness to it because it was so cold. But now that it's kind of warmed back up again, all these great aromas and flavors and richness in the mouth, and it's not watery or thin because it's so cold. So that's why you gotta watch the temperatures on your wines. And if you, if you chill them down a lot and you kind of go, oh, that's kind of weird, let them warm up a little bit. And then you're gonna see how they bloom and how they come, uh, become even better. And then these aromas, the acid starts showing itself. It starts holding up that fruit and the barrels. That barrel is, is a big, it's a high impact barrel in the nose, but it's a low impact in the mouth as far as uh, flavors. The richness from the leaves being stirred, um, that kind of shows up right away. And it rolls back across the back of your tongue. You notice how the Chardonnay stays really up front in your mouth. It doesn't go to the back. Remember how the cabs and some of these bigger reds we talked about, you kind of taste from the back forward. And you can see how this one's kind of more forward roll and then works its way back slowly. Um, for me, anyway, um, real nice richness. I would pair this, boy, I'll tell you right now, was this veal? I would just think milk-fed veal with this wine would be just excellent. And um, even... Uh, those um god veal piccata right now is all i can think of i think it would just go really good with that caper a little bit of lemon and just that that whole i would settle in with this so well doing that um i think that you know, scallops uh scallops saint jacques especially but just you know nice seared scallops um on a good bed of um risotto and the brothers can argue about which risotto that's not my job um so, uh, but uh, yeah, you know, setting out on that, um, just things like that. And, and I talk a lot about herbs from your garden and fresh herbs. Bring in those fresh herbs and you'll see how it changes that. I wouldn't think about dill with this as much, but I think you could think of tarragon and uh, a sage and especially in basil. Lemon basil, anything with lemon basil on this wine would do really well. So, you know, and so grilled, any type of a grilled vegetable medley um, or, you know, and I mean, Eggplant's kind of my go-to grilled vegetable. I really like it because of the texture and the flavor profile. And I know a lot of people don't like it, but I do, especially when you slice it thin, marinate it, and then throw it on a grill. It gives it a whole other dimension um, to do that. So that's what I would, I would say worked really well. Um, couscous in this would work really good too. Um, I think that would, be, that would do well. Um, like I said, nice piece of salmon, any uh, shellfish right now. Anything that was like buttery and heavy, a heavier white sauce would do well with this. Um, even the pasta, I mean, God, linguine and clams right now. God, I'm making myself hungry. I'm going to have to leave. I'll be back in a few minutes. No. Um, would do great. I mean, it's a, it's a beautiful wine. 
Um, I'm not usually a big oaky Chardonnay kind of guy that likes them that way. I'm a Sauvignon Blanc guy, but this is actually a Chardonnay that uh, I'd sit down and drink quite a bit of with a meal, especially um, in a special occasion. Anyway, that's our reserve Chardonnay. Um, and that's um, 2017. Um, 2016 is very similar to this, except for it's bigger. It actually has, a, it's a little oakier. It's um, probably more tropical. <laughs> it's similar, right? Yeah, except for the oak, the tropical flavors, and it's bigger. But otherwise, it's exactly the same bottle, okay, and screen printing. Um, so 16 was a, little bit di was a little bit different year. This 17 was a killer vintage for those uh, Dijon clones, which really show through here. And um, I'm getting like a floral thing right now, and after just letting it just kind of wash through also. So uh, that's kind of, it's kind of nice. So anyway, a lot of fun uh, and a real nice wine. So uh, definitely a great holiday wine. And uh, for like Thanksgiving, uh, that type of thing, that would work awesome. Um, it would go with a lot of different dishes. Okay, so let's move on to Coro Mendocino. Real quick, can you explain the Dijon clone? Dijon clone? Well, it's not mustard. It's an area. So uh, Dijon clones are called an Antov clone. They're clones that come out of uh, Burgundy region in France, and basically it's out of the Dijon area in France where Dijon mustard actually comes from. Um, so we have, uh, I think I showed you different videos we've done. I showed you those, uh, that's the stuff we whole cluster press uh, because it is a little bit more delicate. So that is a clone that comes from France. It's a French driven clone um, and it's cultivated Lenny, right? It is all French budwood, if I remember right, on top, right? Yeah. 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 So, and so it's all developed in France and then was brought to the United States, uh, where some of the other clones that we have that we talk about, like Clone 4, Clone 6, Clone 8, and so on, are all developed here in the United States. So these are a little bit more delicate. Um, the berries are a little bit smaller. It is uh, Pinot Chardonnay, which Pinot Chardonnay means it's a very small berry. So uh, where some of the other Chardonnays we have, our clones are larger Chardonnay, so you have a little more concentration of flavor, but you get a more delicate floral note. Um, so as in like we talked about Pinot before, there's so many different clones of Chardonnay. So this is clone 76 and clone 96 of Dijon um, that we use. Um, 96 is probably one of my favorite Dijon clones, which is the majority of this of this wine. So, all right. Um, which vintage would have less oak? This is probably the least amount of oak is this vintage right here is the 17. Um, the 16 has got a lot of oak. Is most of them most of the reserves have a lot of oak. They are not, uh, uh, by any means, an unoaked Chardonnay. And that's why it's the reserve program. We make them that way. And that's kind of our, even though it's not buttery, that's our oaky buttery style because of that. We, we add so much oak to these wines. These wines actually become, if you probably metered it out, they're probably close to 50% new oak. Um, again, it's 100% French oak. And... Where we're 35%, sometimes 40% in the Brutico, this wine is actually closer to 50 to 55. All right. Someone's asking about on the back of the bottle, it refers to Argento wines. Um, do you know? The Argento wines? So Reserva de Argento. So I have two of the originators here. What is Reserva de Argento story? They both look at each other in amazement that I'm asking them a question. It, it's related to the, the silver-looking package. And Argento, I believe, is an Italian word for silver. So did you guys all hear that? All right. So it's the silver package, and Argento is Italian for silver, we believe, is where that came from. Steve will correct us online here in a minute and say, oh, no, that's my middle name because I make the best risotto. Okay. So... Um, anyway, so that's where the uh, the Argento, I mean, I'll be honest with you, I never knew. I just make, hey, it's reserved shark, drink it. Okay, so it uh, shows you how involved I am in some of these decisions. Uh, but it's a beautiful package. It is a silk screen. It's a great, like Kevin told me a story, somebody's asking, I'm not sure if I like the reserved Chardonnay or the regular Chardonnay. So it's like, well, did it have a paper label or was it silk screen? You know, we make it simple for you to figure that part out. So anyway, all right, we ready for coral? We sure? All right, I can, I can hold on, I can wait.
I have time. Do you? All right, Coro Mendocino. Coro Mendocino is the first consortium outside of Europe, so it means we have rules and regulations on how to make the wines. So uh, similar to Chateau Neuf de Pop, Chianti Classico with the Black Rooster or the DOCG in Europe for like Pinot in, uh, in France and, Char and uh, white, uh, sorry, white Burgundies also. So there are rules on how you make the wines to be able to be called certain things. So the one closest to what we do really is probably Chateau Neuf de Pop, which is a Rhone. And you are told what varietals you can use, which all these consortiums are the same way. Um, and then the other thing that happens is that you're, there's age, aging restrictions. There's also wood and oak restrictions on these wines uh, through consortiums. Where Coro is different is that in Coro, we took it a couple steps further. So if I was in... Uh, Italy and I wanted the Chianti Classico, I wanted the Black Rooster, as long as I followed all of their guidelines and did exactly what they said I had to do, I would be labeled that. Unlike in Coro Mendocino, we took that a couple steps further. We said, no, you have to go through tastings and you have to go through a pass fail. So what happened was, was back in uh, 1998, 97, uh, a bunch of winemakers were getting together saying, hey, how can we showcase Mendocino. How can we show our grapes are, are just as good as anywhere else in California or the world? And so we came, they came up with this idea um, about uh, this Coro brand, or let's say, let's brand something, let's do something like a DOCG. So trying to figure that out, the heritage grape of Mendocino County was Zinfandel. Everybody had Zinfandel. And, you, and so we figured that's the starting point, but we don't want it to be a Zin. We want it to be a blend. And that's very unique. People never thought of Zinfandel as a blending grape or as the main part of the blend. So that's why in Coro, it can be no more than 70%, no less than 40% Zinfandel. So, but Zinfandel has to be the main ingredient. So if you have 50% Zin in your blend, no other varietal can be 51, or if it's 40% Zin, no other varietal can be 41%. Zinfandel has to be the main varietal. So that's the first criteria. And it has to be 100% Mendocino County grapes. That's number one. So anybody in the world can make a Coro, but it has to be 100% Mendocino County grapes. Then um, the other thing is that there's certain varietals you can use. And we basically, most Mediterranean varietals and most Rhone varietals are um, eligible to be made as a Coro. The Bordeaux varietals, the traditional Bordeaux varietals, we want to stay away from because Napa had their Cabernet, and they had, and no, and, and Sonoma County was doing really well with their cabs and so forth. So we wanted to showcase something different. We didn't want that. So we used the basic traditional uh, Zinfandel blenders as as a starting point, plus some other uh, plus some other, um, pardon me, varietals to add on top of that. Then we gave the winemakers 10% free play. So if you did want to add a little cab, go ahead. A lot of winemakers in the past, Pinotage was a big one. Charbono was another one that gets added uh, more recently. Uh, Merlot gets added. Um, so people do add different varietals uh, to this, uh, to these uh, wines, just as their free play, just to add that one little niche that makes it their Coro. So every winery makes their own Coro. Think of Coro as the brand. That's the wine brand is Coro. But Brutico is like the varietal. Okay, so it's a Coro wine, but it's a Brutico, but it's Brutico wine. It's Brutico's Coro. So not every Coro is exactly the same. Every Coro is different. All the winemakers get together and sit around a table and we taste each other's wines and we blind taste them and we critique them. And that is the most nerve wracking thing that ever happens for me, ever. I can sit in front of you guys and talk all day. I can sit in front of a wine writer or judges. Don't care. But sitting around your peers and having them judge your wines. And so some of these guys you grew up around and you know them for a long time and you know you really respect them as winemakers and having them tell you your wine sucks is always like you know no please don't make that mine but during the coral tasting it never fails there's always that one wine you taste going god i hope that's mine and there's the other one you always say god i hope that isn't mine it usually is because your house palate tells you you know that's your wine and it needs something else done to it it is not where somebody points a finger and says, your wine sucks. It's always about this wine has this quality, this quality, this quality. This is taken away from it. This is what needs to be fixed, I think, in this wine. 
and it's all constructive. And what it is, it's all of us working together to make sure each of us is doing their best to make the best uh, representation of Mendocino County. I can't talk, trust me. I took English in school like seven years straight. So, Coral Mendocino. The first thing about Coro that I've always loved <clears throat> is that each Coro is so unique and so different. And with our Coro, because of the different varieties that we use and it becomes this big blend and I love red blends and we talked about this before with Torrent and some of the other ones in Quadriga. So on every Coro bottle, um, on the back side is the blend and we tell you exactly what's in here. And I know you can't see this on your screen, but hopefully you have a bottle in front of you. So this Coro is 58% Zin, 15% Barbera, 12% Syrah, 7% Primitivo, 6% Sangiovese, 2% Petit Syrah. So we use a lot of different varietals in our Coro, and we always have, because each thing, each one brings something different. And the varietals will fluctuate. Some years Zin will be down to like 40%, some years up to 60%. So this 2016 Coro, which is the current release, um, is that was the varietals that year. So the first thing you get, I think when you bring this up, is you get that beautiful, you get some really nice fruit. It's got a, some nice berries going in there, almost like a, like a dark cherry. There's a little bit of a tobacco in the nose coming from the barrel, and there's a spiciness, and right on the back end, is that Mendocino pepper. This is kind of a white pepper in the very back. Kind of in that, you get that little bit of a white pepper on top of all that fruit. Mm. And then you get, there's also a nice little um, like cinnamon stick vanilla kind of thing going on. Remember how we talked about that before, there's different, when somebody says cinnamon, there's always different. There's like powdered cinnamon, cinnamon stick, ground cinnamon. There's cinnamons give you different flavors. Um, and so if you do a lot of cooking or baking or in your grandma's kitchen when she's baking during the holidays, you all these different aromas kind of kick out and you kind of see that. So it's kind of more of a little woodsy, cinnamony. You get that great berry, raspberry, kind of a little bit of a dark mocha. And then right behind that, that Barbera throws a blueberry right in the middle of it all. And that's why it's in there. It's because of that. So you get that nice little kind of mid-palate. Mm. Nice little blueberry. And then it rolls into a kind of an earthiness. Probably the Syrah showing itself there a little bit more. And you get that kind of that spiciness from the oak. And it just kind of rolls on and it just kind of lingers on. It just kind of keeps, stays bright, fruity. Nice, nice oak notes kind of coming in. That's that toasted kind of vanilla. And, um, not jammy, but it's a, there's a fruit in there that's hmm, almost like a currant. A little darker fruit than, than usual for a Zen. But I'm liking that really kind of there's that jammy, that blueberry note, kind of blackberries, dark cherry. So it rolls through. So you can see how all those different varietals kind of together gives you so much. Now, we say Zinfandel and Primitivo are two separate blends. They are two separate varietals. So we don't count those the same. So it doesn't, you know, so they are really different. Um, when we use... Um, when we use our Primitivo in higher percentages, it really gives a lot more raspberry in it uh, than, than the Zinfandel's giving you this kind of, that's that berry and dark cherry, I think, coming through. That spiciness on the back end and that kind of richness is, I think that's the Petit Syrah kind of really showing that spiciness of that grape. Um, so Coro is built to be the, you know, your signature wine, the best wines that come from the county. Um, we only make like 350 cases of this wine. Um, like we only make 500 cases of the Reserve Chardonnay. Pardon me. Um, gulping all that air while I'm tasting wine, it happens. Uh, 
So it's all these different nuances that you see that come in and it's a it's small batch because we want that. We, we're trying to bring those nuances out. We're trying to showcase uh, what it is and what it does. Um, the Coro, the Coro, the people have done Coro and the people that are still uh, active in Coro, they, they, they come in, they come out. Um, there's a camaraderie there and there's a lot of, you know, we give each other a bad time and, and we love joking around with each other and we love, um, we love Mendocino County and, and growing up here especially. And you take a lot of extra pride in making this wine because it's kind of like a showcase wine for the county. We want to make sure we're showing the county at, at its uh, best uh, to do that. Coros range from our Coro, very Italian-esque, um, given our heritage and our varietals that we use, to some Coros which are heavy, uh, Syrah, uh, Zinfandel, and Petit Syrah base that are a lot bigger, bolder, uh, and, and um, probably got a lot more, uh, uh, not body, but just the, the flavor profile is just really big, um, where I think this flavor profile for us, like our Quadriga and our blends, really are food oriented and are made to be enjoyed like they are right now without food where some of the larger style blends are really food developed wines they really want food a little bit more so um that's pretty much our coro story there was a lot uh there's a lot going on with coro we can keep answering a lot of questions the videos really showed a lot about carl so that's why i'm not talking too much about some of that but uh if you guys have any questions about Coro or what else is going on right now, now's a good time to quiz Lynn since Lynn's here. But um, we, we did have a few questions on Coro uh -huh. specifically to start. Um, have the rules been in place since 2001 and, and have they changed? The same rules have been in place since 2000. Um, the only thing... The only thing we changed on the rules was um, we said there was a no competition rule which meant that you could not send a Coro out to be judged at a competition or to be scored. Uh, about um, 10 years ago, we changed that rule. We said, let's get them out there. Let's get some, get them, let's get some scores on them. Let's let, the, let's let people judge them. The only place you cannot judge a Coro or a Coro cannot be entered into is our local Mendocino County competition because we do not want Coros going against Coros. Uh, we want Coros to stand on their own uh, for each uh, individual winemaker and not to be judged as a group. So, um, How often do wineries fail the, the tasting and has Brutico ever failed? Um, no winery to date has failed the tasting. The reason why is we taste at least five times as a group. Usually by the second or third tasting, a winemaker knows whether or not he has a wine that he wants to um, advance or he wants to, somebody to judge as a Coro. And they usually just pull it themselves before that happens. Um, so that's why no wines ever fail because the winemakers usually pull it beforehand. Bruticos has never failed yet. Um, and, you know, I <laughs> hope I never do. I'll Hope I still have a job if that ever happens. But anyway, um, no, we haven't yet because it's the same thing. There's been years where I've wondered if I was going to go, and just because I'm your your own worst critic when you start tasting, you know, and then you go to the tastings and you start seeing what's going on vintage wise, and you can kind of see the the that you know other people are in the same boat. But the funny part is, is that the wines change so much from winter. Um, especially when we start in January to where we end up like this time of year, our past fail tastings next week. So by the time you get to that in May, the wines have actually changed over five to six months. And so that makes a big difference also. And you're looking at individual barrels. Um, we have had one wine that went through past fail that the winemaker uh, tasted it, getting ready to label it says, no, I can't do this. Something happened during bottling and the bottle turned and it turned, the wine turned inside that bottle. So that would be the second rule change that we ever had is that we taste all wines prior to the purchase of labels for those wines. So you bottle your wine. So I have 2017 that I bottled last June that is sitting in a shiner, which means something without a capsule or a label. And we're getting our labels here uh, in the first of June, first two weeks of June to actually label those. You don't get your labels until it's past that second tasting. Uh, again, so that's the whole thing to where we let them sit in the in the bottle for a year, and that's kind of how we make sure that happens. Nobody sells it early, 
and we keep it that way. And then we all release together the third week of June. So, uh, so no, no wine has ever failed. Wines that usually would have failed have never made it that far because they've been pulled. Short answer. <laughs> so Ann and Steve have a, a great two-part question. I'm going to change the first part a little because you just said that Coro does not enter into the Mendocino County competition mm -hmm. because we don't want to go against Coro uh, inside the county. But is there a secret contest each year for the best? No. Not really, because each car is so unique. You can't, there's not like, you can't sit there and judge and who's going to do what, but um, we'll send them. It's up to each winery whether or not they send them out to get scored. Not many wineries do. We do. We get our scored. Um, we're five years straight, 90 plus points on our Coros. Uh, so, you know, so we do send that to wine enthusiasts. I don't send it to any wine competitions, just to just to a couple of uh, the wine writers. Uh, but, yeah, so... No, not really. And it's part two. Have you ever hit anyone at these tastings? No. Not yet. Because I'm not the only Italian. So that's going to be the next competition is that you guys can count how many times I touch my face or lift my hands, right? Yeah. So what's everybody eating tonight? What, what are you guys having with these wines? We're curious. You know, we really didn't give you a menu tonight because we wanted to see what you guys have come up with. So tell us, what are you having right now that's working with these two wines that you really enjoy? Or our Brutica wines that you might be having while you're listening to me? You know, what foods are going, what's uh, going great and, and what's tasting great right now? Um, Luke is having a uh, Primitivo mm -hmm. tonight. And... I think Mary said she was enjoying a Syrah tonight. Mm. How do I know the percentage of each type? It says, how do you know the percentage of each type and who decides? Uh, it's a long process. <laughs> when we blend Coros, right now in a 2018, I'm at blend number 22. So we just go through and we start tasting and just, it's like any of the wines, uh, it's really not different, any different than blending the Chardonnay. We have all the different little sub blends or subgroups, right, that we have on the lots and we start tasting those and putting those together and seeing what works with what. And for the Coro, it's just like, um, I wanted a little bit more fruit in the mid palate. So we boosted the Primitivo up a little bit more because it had some great fruit, and that's where that blueberry's popping in the mid palate. So you just you up that like another two or three percent. Um, some varietals like Petit Syrah and Syrah, a half a percent makes a huge difference because it can be so big and so overpowering. So it's it's by tasting. Um, it's myself and uh, Lydia, my assistant winemaker, and we'll go through and we'll work a bunch of stuff over. Then we'll go, David. Come taste these and see what you think. Uh, so, you you know, and because we'll, we'll get all this palate fatigue and just to see if we're tasting the same thing. So it's the, there's three of us kind of working these wines and going through and tasting all this different stuff. And, um, and you find, you taste the individual wines and it's like some wines will have great aromas and have really terrible mouthfeel. But you want that aroma in that wine, so you add a little bit of that one. But you have wines that are the opposite, no aroma, but great mouthfeel, so... It's kind of works that way. Well, and just to point out, we do a uh, blend your own event a couple times a year in March. Yep. And uh, that's similar where you get to do your own blend and mm -hmm. kind of learn the winemaking process. Get to be a winemaker for the day. So if anyone's planning a trip out here once mm -hmm. uh, we're all let out. Yeah. So that's really is. That's the blend your owns. And we'll, you know, I'll come in, talk about the wines. We have four different wines and then you get to put them together and you put, get your own blend that you made to take home. So we kind of make that for you. Uh, what's your aging preference for this wine? Hmm. I would think it needs probably, I would, I would say it needs to lay down for about another five or six years and then I would start drinking it. And then I would say probably this one the 15 would age a little bit longer. This one's still, that's still in your 20 year range, if not longer. We're tasting, we've been tasting some 20 year old Coros and they're holding up really well. So this wine's got some really good balance. 
good fruit. I mean, I could see this wine, you know, for another, I'd see this wine for another 20, 25 years, but I think it needs to lay down for at least another five or six. And I think then it's going to be at its, uh, it's going to start showing really well. I wouldn't say it's peak, but it's going to start drinking a lot better than it is right now. Um, and, and I guess you kind of said it, but how would you compare the 15 to the 16 Coro? Yeah, 15 is a little bit bigger. This one's, um, I think the, I like the fruit in this one better, but I think the 15 has got a little bit more oomph to it, you know. And speaking of food, what is your suggestion for the pairing for Coro? I'm not telling. I'm, not, I'm done telling you guys what to eat. You got to figure it out for yourself. No. Um. This vintage of Coro, I think this would lend itself really well to um, a pasta, lasagnas, just things like that. I think I would go with the, um, I'm going to tell you, man, that uh, Penny Sangiovese in this wine would be awesome. And that's uh, it's, it's, uh, Luna Tatori at, uh, over in Fort Bragg, or Mendocino, I'm sorry. This is a little Italian restaurant we go to all the time. And they have this dish called Penne Sangiovese, and it is just awesome. This wine would go great with that. Um, it's, uh, it's a, it's a house-made uh, spicy uh, pork sausage that they do, Italian pork sausage, and with penne pasta. And it's, uh, it's got uh, it's a little bit of cream, some cheese, a tomato base, and then it's all fresh handmade pasta, by the way. And then what he does is right at the end, he nails it with some uh, Sangiovese and then stirs that and mixes up, makes this great spicy red sauce that this wine would do well. So I would say um, uh, anything from that, um, in that type of a range. Um, again, like you heard me say in the video, I love king salmon. I love king salmon when it hits the grill. And I especially fresh king salmon um, with this wine is really, is really good. Um, killer wood fire margarita pizza also would be another one um it would be a good one and um actually you know what i'm thinking about is like a mushroom fresh chanterelle portobello mushroom pizza out of a wood-fired oven really good thin uh crust uh really good um uh extra virgin olive oil you know fresh press from brutico uh would taste really good on this especially um where you know what's funny is that i'm thinking the same thing is with our lemon olive oil that we have with the chardonnay on a pizza would be awesome. Again, with maybe a, a chanterelle or uh, maybe an oyster mushroom um, with some just a, just a really lighter style with a little bit of garlic and um, with this wine because that that lemon that Meyer lemon that we use in there comes out with that olive oil uh, and this on a on that pizza dough would be awesome. So um, I don't think there's anything you really couldn't eat with this. Again, you could do steak, you could do pork, but um, Osso Buco would be the other one. That would probably be. That's usually my go-to when I have a when I go to a restaurant. If they have Osso Buco, this is and I have this. I usually get that. So, Haas, what's been the participation in Coro? Over the years, it's fluctuated back and forth. There's been over thirty different wineries who have come in and out of Coro. Um, one of the things I didn't mention earlier is that Brutico is actually one of the founding wineries of Coro. The, the, still, the founding wineries are still in there, most of them anyway. Um, Fetzer's the only one that's not in there now. Um, that's because, you know, they're, they've been sold. The Fetzer family, you know, doesn't own anymore. So that the new owners aren't into, um, don't have a taste room. So it doesn't work that way for them. But um, Parducci, uh, Brutico, Golden, um, Graziano are all are founding wineries. Um, there's a lot of wineries who've been in Brutico who are actually no longer in existence, or Brutico, in Coro, that are no longer in existence. So, um, so, but over the years, about 25 to 30 different wineries have been in and out. Um, how long have you been winemaker for Brutico? 11 years? All right. 10, 11. Since 2009, you do the math, figure it out. Uh, do you want to speak to the Coro label a little bit? Um, sure. Design. Oh, you want me to just actually talk to it? Okay. So the if you look at the Coro label and you can't see it because of the if you look on it, there is an actual outline of Mendocino County on it on the front label. This label is to what it is is the whole image, the whole package is to the old Spanish land grants. So where we're at here in Hopland and the south end of Ukiah 
is the northernmost of the Spanish land grants. So that's where Felice, or Felice Creek was named after one of the lieutenants uh, who was out here from the Spanish army and that family. So, so that's kind of what it mimics to some extent. The cartouche is to symbol, is the, the symbol our coro. That's our symbol, is that cartouche, the same that we have on our shirts and, all, and everything else. Um, on the very bottom is what tells you that this um, vintage and this winery were able to make a coro. So what it does is it kind of tells you that, you know, the coro organization says that you can be a coro and so forth. So that's also on this label. Um, on the back label, it, the back label is just we always want people to know what they're having. So that's why all the information is on the back about the blend uh, going on. So that's kind of the basis of the uh, coral label. So we have uh, some people um, saying what they're eating tonight, some tamales. Uh, cool. Leftover pulled pork and Ritz crackers. Summer sausage uh, with the coro and fresh apricot with the chardonnay. Oh, that'll work. Uh, classic margarita pizza. Yep. Um, someone is 10 pounds heavier, uh, so just Coro for him. <laughs> Join the club. Uh, Luke pairs the Primitivo with Merlot. Ah. So he's on to his next bottle. Cool. Well, that's that's always a good match. It'll always make you feel better. Yeah. Salami and goat cheese. Mm -hmm. um, Six-month Manchego and an 18-month Gouda. That Manchego with uh, quince jam, oh my God, with this wine would be awesome. Mac and cheese with Brussels sprouts. That's awesome. interesting. Uh, fresh homemade sourdough bread. Oh yeah. Uh, thank you for the bread Bible. Yeah. And Karen, where's mine? <laughs> That's all I can say. Um, Joe's pizza pasta, chicken primavera. Oh, there you go. Pork roast um, with a fair amount of pepper in the sauce. And they're drinking Merlot tonight. Mm. Primitivo and San Gervaisi is uh, wine team's favorite, Antonio. Cool. Yeah, I mean, you really can't go wrong that these wines, you know, the, the coral can go many directions. You know, like you get beef, uh, Korean barbecue. That's another one. Because of that little bit of sweetness and all that fruit in there will match up with that. That would be really good. But, you know, i got to tell you, you got to stay Italian with this wine. It's just too much. And coro meaning chorus or one voice. That's the whole other ba basics. If you go, the funny part is if you Google Coro Mendocino, the first thing you're going to get is a Spanish choir. And that uh, Because it is Spanish and Italian for a choir, you know, one voice. So Coro Mendocino, there is a, there is a choir group that's like 200 years old. <laughs> in Spain and so that's the first thing but you have to you know keep keep scrolling you'll you'll find us we are there the coromendocino.org um it's us or .com rather I'm sorry uh, we changed that that's the third thing we changed okay uh so you can find us a little bit easier all those uh, most of those videos you can find are on there on YouTube um it talks about all the different wineries all our protocols we put our protocols actually online so people can see what our limitations are and what we have to do so again, it's one voice uh, speaking out and saying, you know, this is what this is Mendocino County, um, this is Zinfandel, and uh, you know, and, and we love what we do. So, the uh, the Cora website is a beautiful website. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the guy that did that website did such an awesome job. You would be amazed, amazed at the at the kind of work he does. Thank so, you. thank you, Kevin. Uh, is there a minimum? Uh, uh, in in the blending, is there a minimum percentage that? Uh, for a varietal. Zinfandel is the only minimum. And it has to be, can be no less than 40% Zin. That's the only minimum, no more than 70. Otherwise, and then 10% the 10 free play. So you can have, you can use, the wines you can use or the varietals you can use is like, you can use Primitivo, Carignan, Petite Syrah. Um, let's see what else is there. Syrah. Syrah. And, God, there's a whole list of them. Just Sangiovese. can't think of them. Sangiovese. Yeah, most of the time for Sangiovese, Barbera, so Dolcetto, Charbono. Someone's Charbono's Charbono. in there. Mm -hmm. You can use Charbono, and there is, let's see, what's, I know I'm missing one. There's one other one. It's Carrigan Grenache. You can use Grenache. 
Uh, so those are the varietals you can use, but then above and beyond that, you have 10% you can play with on top of that. So that's the only limitations. Uh, is Lydia ever going to join us? No. She, ref she will not do it. She's joined us online. You guys just didn't know it, but yeah. I've asked her. You saw a picture of her. She's uh, one of the people in a hoodie with uh, working the grapes. So you can, uh, you can see her that way. What we'll do is we'll get flashcards like this is Lydia. We'll just. Uh, who is Wine Team Travel? That's a good question. Who is Wine Team Travel? Never heard of those people. <clears throat> Sorry, we're a little backed up on chat. I have 70 more. <laughs> <laughs> Kevin's having a hard time. You guys are asking way too many questions. Go for it. Is there a way to get a case of Coro from all the different producers? Yes. The only way you can do that is through Sip Mendocino, which is our local wine shop here in Hoplin. And they're the only, person, the only place that has all the Coros in one spot. So you can get a hold of them. Uh, I believe it's sipmendocino.com is there um mm -hmm. yeah so you can go to that website and you can order coros from them or you have to get them from each individual winery so um when you're t when we're doing our um the the barrel tasting mm -hmm. that we do in-house uh what signifies that it's something that you want for coro is there something that jumps out at you or you think this is going to go to coro versus brutico uh, yeah, it's a flavor profile that I just taste it and I know it. I can't tell you what it is. I couldn't describe it to you. It's just when we taste something, I just went, oh, that's go that's coral. We need that for coral. And it's just, uh, I just, I don't, you know, in, uh, in words and write it down, I could be a professor and sell books and then I wouldn't have to do this every day. Just make my money that way. But no, it's just, it's a feeling, I'll be honest with you. For me, my winemaking style is more of a, it's, it's a gut feeling, and I have a big enough gut for it. So when I feel something, that's huge. Um, but yeah, it's just, uh, it's what we need and what we, you know, what I'm looking for. And there's nothing in particular. It's just something that we, I really like. And I'll be honest with you, a lot of times, something that I'll taste and I'll look over at Lydia, and Lydia will taste it at the same time. We'll both just go, oh. you know, it's just, we know you know you're tasting something that you really like. So that a lot of times you'll see something like that. But uh, there's a lot of times I pick things that she doesn't like and she'll pick things that I don't like. But, uh, but you know, it's just, that, it's just that feeling that you just kind of know. Um, what's the difference when blending wine that's already bottled to the juices fermented together? Um, I, it might... Maybe they're trying right. to ask about like. So this is when we when we ferment something. We're when we bring uh, a wine or grapes in, we bring them in from a certain part of the block, and we make that's a lot. That's one lot of wine. It is vinified that way. So we make that into wine. We age it and we keep it that way, especially for Brutico. Um, if at some point in time I'm tasting that wine and I have another wine that's very similar and we have an issue about space and I need to make some more space, we might put those two together. But usually those lots stay that way then we will go through and we will taste them so when it comes time to blending especially for brutica wines we'll taste all the individual lots and we'll taste them to see what where they could work not work what do they bring to the table at that point in time when we're tasting individual barrels also to see whether we want to hold barrels out of that varietal for certain projects because they're special so there's there's a couple different things happening all at the same time so the blending process, when we kind of put stuff together, is we're actually taking all the individual lots, and then we're putting those together in the lab, actually. We take samples like this. We'll put, you know, 5% of this, 10% of that. No, that didn't work. And start, you know, and we just start working back and forth, finding that flavor and aroma and finish that we need for that particular varietal and that particular wine. Then those get blended up. And then that becomes that wine. So, and that's what goes to bottle at that point in time. So we keep them separate for quite, for almost their entire life. Um, so like the 2000 
and 18 wines we're doing right now, they actually were pretty separated up until February. We blended some of them together back then. We did minor blends, and then we did the final blending of those lots. So we took, basically, take 30 lots, took them down to 10, and then now we're working with those 10 lots to make the final blend, like just for the Cabernet. So let's say, for example, that's what that happened there. So um, hope that made you more confused. I don't know. We'll I'm not sure if you just said this, but do you ever blend um, like different varietals uh, pre-fermentation? No, no. I I like to keep them separated. Like, I don't is put, that yeah. something that people do? Like, with isn't it something they do with Vignet and Syrah? Sometimes you can. I mean, people have done that before, but no, we keep all for us everything separate. I don't care. I don't like blending because I don't. I want the vineyard to show me what it's going to do, and I'm usually picking different yeasts to do different things. So I don't, it doesn't work for me to do that. So all the time I spend out in the vineyard, it's not for me to go, oh, just throw it all together. So anyway. We're caught up on the chat. Any cool. more questions? All right. Well, it's almost that time anyway. Hey, um, just to let you guys know again, remember next week we're going to be doing Blissful Red 2017, which is always fun, which is technically still kind of a brutico wine because it's all the leftovers from making all these other wines go into blissful red um and we're also going to be doing the bliss chardonnay right yeah so um if i remember correctly i guess i gotta check my list here and see so that's that's yeah. correct and and also the blissful mm -hmm. red being a new release it's available in the six pack that we put together mm -hmm. uh the virtual tasting six pack number three uh, it will short be available shortly uh, individually as well, but for now it's in mm -hmm. that six pack if you're looking for it. Yeah, it's the only way you can get it right now. If you get the six pack, you'll have that wine. So the uh, the new up and coming. So those will be kind of fun to do. A little bit of uh, blood or blissful red as we uh, here at the winery. So and uh, just a couple more questions mm -hmm. coming in, and one of these we missed last week. Um, uh, what's your philosophy on yeast, native versus added? Um. Three years ago, I would have told you it doesn't really matter. And then tasting some different wines. If there's, um, sometimes what happens, I think, with a native yeast, it's a slower fermentation. It's a, it takes a lot longer. So it develops some different flavor profiles by using native yeast. Um, but if I have commercial yeast being used in the winery at the same time, it's kind of hard to segregate to say which yeast is actually doing it. Um, I like using uh uh, added commercial yeast because they have been selected because of different profiles that they add to the wine and you can kind of use those to help put the vineyard is showing you and the flavors to, to help preserve them and to boost them. So um, I think there's a place for both of those, honestly. Um, I'll tell you right now a quick story. Bob Swain, who you saw in the videos earlier from Parducci, they had an accident where they had a what we call a Bronco which is a wild fermentation, something you wouldn't plan, on uh, a Zinfandel that they had, or Petit, I'm sorry, Petit Syrah that they had, and all of a sudden this vineyard showed all this pepper that they'd never had before using the commercial yeast. So it started them on a program for doing nothing but natural fermentations to, because it showcased, because commercial yeast would not showcase that because it probably burned it out so much fermenting so fast. So we've played with it a little bit. We do a little bit here and there. It happens. And, um, but uh, for the most part, we do use a, a commercial product. We don't do a wild fermentation, part of which is because we just don't have the room or the time for it. But we have done uh, macro um, small lot fermentations uh, to help do that, to help develop that vineyard, to see what characteristics come out of it. Um, but um, so either way, I think it's, it's, it, it depends and it works. Do you make grappa? No. Uh, but what do we use? So we do use our own grapes for our distillation. We have a grape spirit that uh, we do distill a grape spirit, but it's not grappa. Grappa is a whole other element. Uh, it's, a, it's a process. And to make grappa, you have to distill it a certain way. It has to be aged a certain way. So no, we don't do that. But we do have our own grape spirits uh, from our own vineyards that we have that we use for our ports and mistel. And uh, real quick, I want to thank Larry and Lynn. They've been enjoying our wines for almost 40 years, and they're on here tonight, and uh, we really appreciate them 
uh, jumping on and, and hanging out with us virtually. Oh, yeah. Thank you so much. That's awesome. Cool. I think that's it for tonight, guys. Hey, really appreciate everybody. Uh, great questions. A lot of fun doing this. We're going to continue doing this. Um, next week, pretty much the same format. After that, it's going to change a little bit. Um, only one wine, but we're going to get a little bit more in depth, a little more talk about the vineyards, what's going on, because the vineyards are actually getting ready to start blooming. So we can actually start showing you some pictures of the flowers, the process, a little bit more going on. Um, also in the winery, the same thing. We're getting ready to start bottling. So we can show you some more of the bottling uh, projects that we have going on, plus what's going on in the winery to prep for bottling. So a little bit more intuitive videos about, about actually how we do our day-to-day -day job. Um, we might we'll probably let Steve talk some more, you know, just things like that. So uh, we're going to have a lot more fun. Everybody stay safe. Keep your, uh, you know, keep a smile on your face. Keep laughing. We get, we're going to make it through all this stuff. And uh and thank everybody for all the Brutica wine you guys have been buying over the last month uh, and keeping this going. And we're going to do it for another six weeks and, uh, and keep going from there. We'll see what happens. Again, thank you so much. And, uh, hey, you know, a little double salute, a little red and white. Um, cheers. And thank you from myself and the Brutico family. Salute. Stay healthy.